So I think that we will get started. I would like to welcome everyone to uh, this uh, discussion session. Uh, it's uh, the Lancet series on ending HIV in America. And this discussion for the next hour and a half are implications of those papers for rural America. And I would like to thank all of you for joining this morning and all of our presenters and respondents. Uh, I want to just sort of lay out a little bit of the format. We're going to have each of the uh, presenters, after a few opening comments, uh, present their papers, two, three, four slides. Then we'll have uh, three distinguished respondents that I'll introduce at the time. And then we really have a distinguished panel who will provide their perspective and discuss uh, some of the issues in the last 15 minutes. We'll be taking uh, questions, and if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A section uh, as, as you have them. Um, also, uh, they make me sort of read these housekeeping rules. It says refrain from foul and inappropriate language, but I'm sure that that's not a problem with any of our participants or presenters. So um, I'd like to really thank uh, the Lancet uh, for co-sponsoring this event. And specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Beth Cooney, who's the associate editor for the Lancet for the USA. And she was really tremendously helpful in really uh, moving this series forward. Uh, but all of the folks at The Lancet, we really appreciate your support and your help. I'd also like to thank Amfar and NIDA, who were supporters of the series uh, as well. Uh, today, uh, today's session is co-sponsored in addition by the Office of AIDS Research. Uh, and you know, I, I wanna say that Actually, uh, Dr. Beyer um, deserves a big thank you because I just suggested that we talk about implications of the series for Amer for the US. He said, I'm gonna, do you mind if I speak with Dr. Goodno, director of uh, the Office of AIDS Research? She was enthusiastic uh, and is here today and I wanna thank her and her coworkers, Stacy Carrington, Cornelius Baker and Judy Arbach. Uh, our other co-sponsor is also from the NIH. It's the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, particularly Dr. Lee and the Institutional Development Award uh, Program, IDEA Program, who funds multiple centers for translational, clinical and translational research in rural areas. And several of the respondents are actually investigators in this area from those uh, CTRs. Um, I'd like to get started with just, you know, some context. You know, historically, West Virginia has had among the lowest HIV incidence and prevalence in the nation. However, new diagnoses have increased over the past two years, just at the time when we're talking about eliminating HIV in the United States. The average number of new HIV diagnoses per year for the five-year period from 213 to 217 for West Virginia was 77 cases uh, per year but that went up to 87 cases in 2018. And in 2019 and 20, there was an average of 135 cases per year. I suspect with the COVID epidemic, that is an underestimate for 220. Uh, in 2014, 12.5% uh, of new diagnoses were attributed to injection drug use, but by 2019 in West Virginia, two thirds of new cases were attributed to injection drug use. Uh, clearly there is much to be done in West Virginia and in rural America to end the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, the recent Lancet series published February 19th is comprised of six papers that survey the ongoing challenges to ending the epidemic. And this will focus our discussion. I'd like to, to um, introduce Dr. Maureen Goodno, who is co-sponsoring this webinar. Dr. Goodno is the uh, National Institutes of Health Associate Director for AIDS Research and Director of the Office of AIDS Research. And in this role, she coordinates the NH-wide HIV AIDS Research Agenda to end the, the HIV epidemic. She's also Chief of the Molecular HIV Host Interactions Laboratory at NIH. And prior to going to NIH, she was Professor of Pathology, Immunology, and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville. Uh, where she held the Stephanie Holloway University Endowed Chair for AIDS Research. She has been a leader in the field for many, many years, 
published over 100 uh, papers and book chapters and has trained more than 35 doctoral and postdoctoral fellows. So welcome, Dr. Goodenow. Would you like to make some opening comments? Sure, thank you, Sally, and for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, the NIH Office of AIDS Research is really happy to be able to co-sponsor this event. This past September, I presented during the West Virginia statewide HIV meeting, and I'm excited to rejoin you uh, to focus attention around issues of HIV in rural America. What really stands out is that many of the issues mentioned during that September meeting are highlighted in the Special Lancet Supplement we're talking about today. The authors of the supplement, HIV in the United States, point out that the US HIV epidemic requires sustained scientific and public health attention. We couldn't agree more and through a multidisciplinary, comprehensive and increasingly integrated research approach, NIH supported HIV research contributes to the development of interventions that match the needs of a community and are delivered at the scale needed to achieve the US and global goals to end HIV. OAR continues to support creativity and innovation, and we look forward to expanding our work with partners and stakeholders in rural America to accelerate research discoveries and innovation that encompass the research priorities for rural communities. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to hearing the key findings from the uh, contributors of this special Lancet supplement and joining the panel discussion that follows. Sally, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Goodnow. It's really my pleasure to introduce the first uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Patrick Sullivan is the Charles Howard Chandler Professor of Epidemiology at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, and he's co-director of the Prevention Sciences Corps at Emory Center for AIDS Research, the CIFAR there. He's worked in HIV prevention for 26 years, and before coming to his current position at Emory, Patrick worked at uh, CDC as an EIS officer and in HIV surveillance. His current research focuses on HIV among men who have sex with men, including behavioral research interventions, implementation, and surveillance, and he's PI in the UNC Emory Adolescent Trials Network. Uh, Dr. Sullivan will uh, really present the paper that I think sets the stage on current epidemiology. Patrick? Thank you, Sally, and um, such a, an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be um, presenting today, the slides should hopefully come up. Um, I'll start out by saying, you know, the, the title of this paper um, really calls out in terms of the epidemiology. The epidemiology we can think about in terms of epidemic burden, which is often the first thing we think about, but also inequities, contexts, and responses. And so I'm going to present on behalf of my um, fantastic co-authors and talk a, a bit about each of those. On the next slide, you know, I want to start with a map because um, I think a map tells you where you are and a map tells you where you need to go. And I think we can think about the epidemiology of the HIV epidemic in these terms. And so when you look at the map of the United States, this is a, uh, an image that is um, in the series and from our aidsu.org site, you can, uh, you, your eye is drawn to the sort of density of infection, HIV infections or people living with HIV in the Southern United States. But when this map first came out, one of the things that really struck out to me, we have an animation of you can just click once, and I'm gonna highlight a, a set of counties that run from the Southern part of Virginia through North Carolina, South Carolina, South of Atlanta, South of Montgomery, and then out to the Mississippi River Valley. And these are um, counties that, which are in the same sort of top 10% of US counties in terms of epidemic intensity, but are not in the big cities. And one of the things that's different about the epidemic in the South is that we see these very, concentrated epidemics within counties, not just in major urban areas, but also in rural areas. And in the, uh, as we move forward, we're gonna see that these disparities um, dig down into, uh, are sort of nested within these high impact counties by race, ethnicity, among men who have sex with men, trans folk, and people who inject drugs. The next slide is about contacts. And, and so here you see that same map of burden, but now you can see how that looks relative to poverty and people without health insurance and sort of the co-occurrence in the South of these three, um, these three sort of health conditions or health disparity conditions. 
And as epidemiologists, we're always careful to say just because the areas that are high poverty are also high HIV prevalence doesn't mean one causes the other. But I think it helps us think about the context in which we need to respond. One, that high HIV prevalence in the South and in rural areas um, is definitely uh, arises as a result of a combination of conditions and access to services is one of the is one of those I'll mention in the responses, but also that we need to think about how we're going to work to provide good care for HIV and HIV prevention in a situation where there's a higher level of poverty, more people living without health insurance, and that's part of our response. Um, U.S. states in the uh, South have HIV epidemics that are more intense in other regions. And most states that have not yet um, expanded Medicaid are in the South and also has this um, feature of high concentrations in rural areas. The next slide deals with inequities. And so um, with the first animation, we can just see that if you compare the prevalence of HIV in the South compared to the Midwest, um, that's about a twofold greater prevalence um, in, in the South. But I mentioned before that these inequities are nested. And so um, within the Southern epidemic, which is already a high prevalence epidemic, the next uh, animation will show that among black Americans, the prevalence of HIV is seven times greater. If we, if we look at that black white relationship just at within women in the next animation, that's a 17.6 fold um, disproportionate impact. And the last animation shows that um, trans women and men who have sex with men compared to heterosexual Americans both have disparities in prevalence that are over a hundredfold. And these are just sort of um, shocking, I think, in any epidemic. And so thinking about um, not just the South as a place that's disproportionately impacted, but about the groups that live uh, and, um, and you know, work and uh, socialize and, and have health or the lack of it within the South, is really a series of nesting and equities. And then I'll end uh, by talking about responses. And so understanding that the disproportionate impact in the South is a, a uh, sort of a multifactorial um, issue that relates to, um, you know, uh, for example, less health insurance, high healthcare provider shortages, lower le levels of health literacy, high levels of sexually transmitted infection, and stigma that's associated with HIV care. Um, one of those things that we can tackle pretty directly is, um, is healthcare. And so we call for Medicaid expansion in the South. Uh, also addressing other risks for poor health like provider shortages, health literacy, and stigma. Um, we advocate for using data to direct public health and policy responses. And we have a section in the paper that talks about molecular epi and how that can be used to direct, um, to address emerging outbreaks. And finally, within our Southern response, we need to focus resources on health inequity populations, especially Hispanic and Black MSM, trans men and women, Black women and people who inject drugs. And to the extent that we can have these kind of discussions, not just in the South as a region, but within states and within cities, we provide a lot of these sort of city-specific data on our AIDSU.org site. Those data should be used um, to have a, a, have a local discussion of evidence-based responses to the local epidemics. And I will stop there. Patrick, thank you very much. That was terrific. Our next speaker, Dr. Tonya Poteet, is Assistant Professor of Social Medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, as well as core faculty in the UNC Center for Health Equity Research. After completing her PhD at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Poteet served for two years in the office of the US Global AIDS Coordinator as the Senior Advisor for Key Populations. Since returning to academia in 2014, Dr. Poteet's research, teaching, and practice have focused on HIV and LGBT health disparities with particular attention to the health and well being of transgender communities. Uh, we welcome her today to speak about HIV and women in the U.S. What do we know and where do we go? Tonya? Thank you, Sally, for this great introduction. And thank you, Patrick, for laying the groundwork for um, where we go from here in terms of the data. I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the impact of context on women is going to resonate with what you just said. So we can go to the next slide where we just talk about the distribution of HIV among women in the U.S. The incidence of new HIV diagnosis among cisgender women in the US has actually fallen um, over the last several years. However, the disparities have not. 
and that is of major concern. We also don't necessarily have longitudinal incidence data for transgender women, but we do know that the prevalence of HIV among transgender women is quite high with an overall prevalence of 14%, but again, significant disparities with the prevalence of 44% among black trans women and 25% among Hispanic and Latina trans women. These disparities exist not only by race, but also as pointed out by Patrick, by geography and by poverty. And in fact, according to the CDC, among the 93% of the almost 5,000 new infections among black women in 2016 would not have occurred if the incidents were the same between black women and white women. So I think we need to look at what, what is this impact of race and what does it mean? Um, about half of the women living with HIV are in the South, 29% are in the Northeast and even fewer in the Midwest and West. And most of the women who have acquired HIV acquire it from sex with men. In fact, over 50% of the infections in women between 2010 and 2015 were acquired from sex with men who had a previous diagnosis of HIV. HIV incidence among women who inject drugs has been relatively stable, but it does represent an opportunity to prevent spread to women if we address the HIV epidemic among injection drug users who are male partners of cisgender women in particular. We can go to the next slide. As we already discussed, the HIV suppression among women, just like HIV incidence among women, varies by region, as well as within regions and by race. And these differences really reflect access to care as pointed out by Patrick in terms of poverty and also in rural areas in terms of distance to healthcare services. And these social and economic forces as well as the distribution of public health efforts and resources are really a result of political and economic decisions. So things that we as um, members of the public and hopefully members of the voting public can have some influence over. Within this broad category of women, there are distinct subgroups of women who are impacted by HIV in different ways. And I won't have time to go into each of these categories, but you can imagine how some of the, um, these differences might happen according to age. So older women compared to younger women have different um, issues that are raised around HIV, reproductive age women who are concerned around pregnancy, pregnancy prevention, childbirth and transmission, and transgender women. Among those who are among the most frequent and severe comorbid conditions that are experienced by women include those that are associated with aging like obesity, cardiovascular disease, and neurocognitive impairment. And these conditions are already more prevalent in rural areas and um, mean that women living with HIV in these rural areas are already at greater risk of these conditions and it's, this is exacerbated by HIV. We can go on to the next slide. I think where we go from here um, means that we need to engage more women, cis and trans women in clinical trials in sufficient numbers to allow us to have a meaningful analysis by sex and by gender. We need sustained high quality health coverage and universal, universal access to healthcare to address some of those barriers related to poverty and distance to care. We really need unfettered access to behavioral health care, housing, food security, childcare, and other services that allow women to have agency in their own prevention and care. And a big, a big ask is to eliminate race, class, and gender inequities, discrimination, structural violence that have really promoted and maintained this distribution of HIV in the US. And if we don't do anything about it, we'll continue to fuel these disparities that we see in the epidemic well into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tonya. That was, that was really very, very enlightening. Our next presenter, Dr. Ken Mayer is professor at Harvard Medical School, professor in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and director of HIV prevention research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Mayer has provided care to people living with HIV since the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, you know, I cannot overstate what an impact uh, Ken's lifelong work has had. He developed some of the first cohort studies and prevention interventions dealing with HIV and is the founding medical research director of the Fenway Institute where he continues to teach and mentor medical students, residents, and fellows. Ken is gonna to present to us on the persistent and evolving HIV epidemic in American men who have sex with men. Ken? Dr. Hodder, thank you so much for um, creating this space to have this conversation. Uh, 
want to thank my co-authors um, who represent a diverse group of scholars. And what we did was a, a fairly systematic review of the literature, which is quite extensive about uh, the epidemic among um, men who have sex with men in, in the US. The next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the uh, demographic trends, um, we first have to recognize that the first population that was described with what came to be known as um, AIDS were men who have sex with men in the US. And, and they've continued to be a population with an incredibly um, great disease uh, burden. In 2018, um, almost 70% of new HIV infections in the US were among gay and bisexual men. And of the diagnoses among men who have sex with men, 37% uh, were among Black and 30% were among Latino MSM. And a quarter of those diagnosed with HIV were 13 to 24 years of age and 39% were 25 to 34 years old. So we have an epidemic that is increasingly affecting younger uh, men who have sex with men of color in the United States. And next slide, please. Uh, so the um, drivers of the epidemic are diverse. And I think one of the key themes when one reviews what we know about the epidemic among men who have sex with men is it's an incredibly heterogeneous um, epidemic with some common drivers. So the biological drivers are the increased susceptibility of the anal mucosa to HIV transmission and acquisition. And then there's this concept of role versatility, which is unique among men who have sex with men. Um, if um, um, receptive anal intercourse is the most efficient way to acquire HIV, uh, that puts the population at risk for acquisition. But if um, those same individuals can engage in behavior that can be efficient for transmitting HIV, um, this role of versatility can uh, be a unique potentiator of HIV transmission. But there are other um, drivers that are quite diverse and these range from structural and social uh, kinds of issues and issues related to networks, as well as individual behavioral factors. And the take home from this is that this means that one size won't fit all and that interventions need to be multifaceted and tailored for the specific populations. One key concept that's emerged over the past few years has been the idea of growing up in non-affirming environments. And this can lead to internalized stigma, developmental challenges. And this is hard enough for um, youth growing up um, um, without um, social support, but this can be exacerbated if other adversities occur. Poverty, childhood um, abuse, um, familial exclusion. And these um, kinds of experiences of homophobia and other stressors can lead to depression and can lead to uh, substance use as a coping behavior. And this in turn can uh, result in uh, poor decision-making, increased sexual risk-taking, uh, uh, non-engagement in care, decreased medication adherence, potentiating new transmission cycles. Next slide, please. So with regard to the um, topic today of focusing on the epidemic in rural America, first need to take into account the fact that rural America is the home to many LGBT people. Uh, there are many wonderful reasons why um, LGBT people live in rural America, closeness to family of birth, um, the social supports, uh, connection to the land, uh, just the general um, beauties of the rural way of life. But this also has other challenges for uh, LGBT people. By virtue of being a minority population, there may be increased visibility in areas with uh, less population. Uh, there may be uh, ripple effects um, uh, where one may be excluded in one sector, um, may be excluded in other, other sectors as well. And fewer of the kinds of social supports that individuals may have in urban environments. And this again, uh, can, this internalization and this experience of uh, uh, discrimination can lead to um, um, exacerbation of all kinds of adverse uh, health outcomes. Uh, so certainly uh, this is uh, something where, again, we have to think of unique culturally tailored um, interventions and programs for uh, LGBT people living uh, in rural America. Next slide, please. So when we think about um, what we need to do, and uh, Chris Byer will be talking more about the call to action. First of all, is recognizing the demographic and, and gender diversity of men who have sex with men. Um, certainly recognizing that we have a disproportionate uh, epidemic among Black and Latino MSM, and that's potentiated by poverty, racism, there are issues around uh, partnership dynamics, and this requires specific um, programs. Certainly for rural MSM, um, they may be socially isolated and also may need specific programs to recognize their unique cultural needs. Younger MSM may be 
more prone to engage in risk uh, by virtue of being younger um, and maybe also more comfortable engaging in digital media, um, uh, meeting partners online. This can create risky environments, but also really is a way forward in terms of developing interfaces that can be um, supportive individuals in this digital age. Uh, we shouldn't forget older MSM uh, who uh, may need tailored programs as well. Uh, there may be substantial social isolation and we need to also understand um, how to support their resilience. We also need to understand of HIV as a chronic disease which may interact with medications as well as age associated morbidities. Uh, we also want to uh, point out that there is a population of transgender men who have sex with men and they have unique health and social challenges, uh, uh, including obtaining gender affirmative care at the same time while obtaining appropriate HIV uh, specific care. And then lastly, in the current era that we have with uh, the tools of pre-exposure prophylaxis and the recognition that people who are virally suppressed are not gonna transmit HIV, U equals U, this really highlights the role of healthcare professionals uh, where they really need to be playing a key role in engaging people and supporting people in care. But this means uh, being culturally competent to work with sexual and gender minority populations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayor, for that terrific presentation. Our next presenter, Dr. Judith Feinberg, is Professor of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry and Professor of Medicine, as well as the E.B. Flink Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine at West Virginia University. Like others uh, on this distinguished panel, she has spent decades in the area of HIV AIDS, actually serving as a, a very, very early uh, medical officer uh, at NIH for some of the very early HIV trials. In 2005, Dr. Feinberg uh, was the first physician in metropolitan Cincinnati. At that time, she was at the University of Cincinnati to recognize that opioid injection drug use had emerged as a health threat based on increased admissions to the hospital for infective endocarditis. She became involved in harm reduction efforts uh, and was tireless. Uh, and after nine years uh, succeeded in establishing Ohio's third syringe exchange and its first true syringe services program, the Cincinnati Exchange Project. Uh, she came to join us at West Virginia University in 2015 to focus on ending uh, HIV um, and opioid related epidemics at the epicenter. Dr. Feinberg. Thank you very much, Sally, for that kind introduction. Uh, so on behalf of my distinguished um, panel of co-authors, I want to present uh, our chapter, The Opioid Crisis and HIV in the United States, Deadly Synergies. Next slide, please. So there have certainly been recent HIV outbreaks among people who inject drugs. And these have occurred in both rural and urban settings. I think the most striking uh, wake up call was the 2014 through 2016 uh, outbreak in uh, rural southeastern Indiana and Scott County. And these are areas that have limited or no access to HIV prevention modalities um, or HIV care. Uh, the awareness of HIV is limited both among the population, but sadly also among healthcare providers. Uh, the, on top of that, medication for opioid use disorder, which is associated with HIV risk reduction, uh, decrease in HIV infections, decrease in hep C infections, but only a small minority of people, around 15% or a little less in this country, receive this kind of medication. Syringe services programs are as an important um, feature to decrease HIV transmission and increase entry into care, but significant barriers to syringe service programs exist all over this country. And in particular, in areas that have the greatest need uh, as we are currently experiencing here in West Virginia. So it's of interest to note with regard to syringe services and the trajectory of the HIV epidemic among people who inject drugs, that with the introduction and implementation of syringe exchange in the 90s, the proportion of people who were acquiring HIV through injection drug use, sharing syringes and injection materials um, really declined consistently 
until about 2014, when that decline leveled off for a couple of years. And now, as Sally said in her introduction, what we are seeing in the last several years is a, is a sharp increase in the proportion of individuals who are acquiring their HIV through um, injection drug use. And just to underscore what um, Dr. Poteet said, the 21st century opioid epidemic is really uh, pretty much an equal opportunity problem for men and women, unlike the, the heroin uh, epidemic of the last century, which was predominantly among men. So the proportion of women who are vulnerable to HIV is really increasing significantly. And you can see in the, um, the graph here in the upper right hand corner that HIV diagnoses among women, and this was two years ago, tw three years ago, 2018, uh, was greatest among white women and greatest among women who were injecting drugs. So, uh, and that is kind of a, a really um, frightening uh, proportion there of women who inject drugs, 34% compared to women who acquire their HIV from heterosexual contact, 65%. So although HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis is certainly recommended for people who inject drugs, really few receive it. Uh, even when it is made available at no cost, uh, you know, it, it, in county health departments, as we've tried to do in um, some locations here in West Virginia, it just has been a very hard, it's been a hard sell. On top of which people who inject drugs just experience what um, both Dr. Portit and uh, um, Dr. Sullivan said is we have fragmented healthcare, is a distinct lack of insurance and stigma, uh, which cannot be underestimated, is an, are all barriers to both treatment for substance use disorder and interventions that can help prevent HIV, including not only PrEP, but also syringe services. So we, what we really need here are integrated strategies that, require, that are required in order to address not only the injection drug use, which is the huge risk for HIV, but all of the other comorbid conditions that are the fellow travelers uh, to substance use disorder, mental health problems, and the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases. And uh, I think this is something that we're beginning to understand and recognize and uh, approach, but it, it, it needs a scale up at an extraordinary level. Next slide, please. So among the recommendations that we have for this particular aspect of uh, what we're dealing with in terms of the current HIV epidemic in the United States is number one is we just have to diminish stigma. Um, and this exists not only in the public at large, self-stigma among people who do inject drugs and sadly stigma on the part of healthcare providers and healthcare systems. We need, as was said before, to provide comprehensive health insurance for all. Um, healthcare, substance use treatment and harm reduction services, including syringe exchange, have to be integrated and easy to access and the use of primary care clinics to deliver these services really needs to be leveraged, particularly in rural areas. The continued war on drugs that relies on incarceration rather than treatment just has to end. Now we've been doing this now for decades and it hasn't worked, it's not going to work. Because although we've criminalized um, drug use, substance use disorder is not a crime, it's a chronic relapsing brain disease. And we need evidence-based approaches to cope with this. As has also been said by other speakers, the social and structural determinants of health play a real role in these um, rural environments, which are have a great deal of um, social and economic disruption, and uh, you know have developed sort of a certain amount of rootlessness in terms of uh, the what used to be, I think, a fairly um, enveloping social structure. Uh, and that has really atomized as the 
economic underpinnings of rural America have, um, have been destroyed. I think the last thing to think about, and it really is um, part of what I just finished saying is what are the root ca causes? Why do so many people have turned to opioids and the use of other substances? Actually, the opioid epidemic is rapidly morphing into a, uh, a stimulant epidemic as well. We really need to identify why this happens and we need to address these things effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feinberg. Much to think about. Uh, our next presenter, Dr. Jen Cates, is Senior Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation, where she oversees policy analysis and research focused on the US government's role in global health and on the global and domestic HIV epidemics. Widely regarded as an expert in the field, Dr. Cates regularly publishes and presents on global health and HIV policy issues and is particularly known for her work analyzing donor government investments in global health, assessing and mapping the US government's global health architecture, programs and funding, and tracking and analyzing major US HIV programs and financing and key trends in the HIV epidemic, an area in which she has been working for close to 30 years. I can't think of anyone more qualified uh, to uh, talk to us today about insurance coverage and financing landscape for HIV treatment and prevention in the US. Dr. Cates. Thank you so much. And it's really great to be here um, and, and have this opportunity. Um, I think our this paper is, is, you've already heard a lot of the themes that came out in our paper being discussed because insurance coverage and financing is so integral to what people with and at risk for, of HIV are able to, how their lives are structured in, in the United States. So what we tried to do here was take a broad look at what's changed and what the, uh, what's eased, what the barriers are. Next slide. And, and just one, before I go through these really quickly, I'll just say we didn't focus on rural versus urban distinctions in this paper, but most of the challenges and issues we address are definitely um, worse in rural areas and for those who live in in, in rural areas, um, not I wouldn't say you know there's some there's some that could be uh, easier to to address in a rural area, but by and large, people at risk for HIV or people living with HIV in rural areas face additional barriers. So our key messages were um, that before the ACA, people with and at risk for HIV faced substantial barriers to healthcare access and coverage, as um, many of us know who, who work in this space. And that remarkably, the ACA has led to a dr dramatic drop in the uninsurance rate. And that's something to, to really pay attention to and, and celebrate. But still, despite that, because insurance isn't everything, the US trails other high-income countries in many different key HIV metrics, including viral suppression. And our system of HIV care and prevention is very complex. It involves multiple payers and providers and financing mechanisms. And ultimately, what you have access to varies substantially and depends almost entirely on where you live. The ACA has, has really worked to smooth that out across the country, but those differences still exist. We looked at the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative, which uh, provides new funding and focus and political will. But there, because of an uneven playing field that still exists, as we've already heard, that its success will, will be challenged. And ultimately what we um, determine is that curbing the national epidemic will depend on uncertain future of healthcare financing and prevention, safety net program challenges, curtailing high HIV drug costs and addressing uh, complex inequalities and stigma and discrimination. And I think this is probably the common theme across all of our papers, this last point. Next slide. The next one just shows viral suppression in the US compared to uh, other peer countries. And you can see this is 2018, the most recent year where there were data, and the US is just trailing every other peer country. Next slide. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ACA has led to an increase in coverage. It's also important to note that how people with HIV get their insurance um, in the United States is, is different than the general population. And most notably, uh, Medicaid plays a much bigger role for people with HIV than it does for the general population and employer sponsored insurance plays a smaller role. And that has continued over many, many years. Next slide. 
We do know from studies that we've done that Medicaid expansion, which is a, a key feature of the ACA, has actually made a difference. And this, this basically compares non-expansion states to those that expanded and shows that Medicaid coverage in those states went up significantly for people with HIV and the share that was uninsured went down significantly. So we know that Medicaid expansion plays a big role in, in providing coverage. It doesn't mean it solves all the access challenges, but it's, it's a very important and more than just one ingredient, it's a fundamental ingredient. But since we're talking about rural uh, America and the challenges there, I just wanted to end with this last slide, which I think is similar to what Patrick showed, but um, uh, he was showing mostly at the county level, just to highlight that the percent of people that are uninsured in the US does vary. And you can see the states where it's highest are the states that have not expanded Medicaid. And Medicaid expansion, if we think about it, is a structural intervention. It's something that is done at the policy and financing level that has a real impact on people's lives and doesn't require individual behavior change in the same way. And to the extent that many of these states with the darker uh, colors, meaning they have higher uninsured populations, do end up moving towards Medicaid expansion, we will hopefully see a more even share of, of coverage across the country, which again, I think will be a, a fundamental ingredient, certainly not the only one in addressing some of the inequities that we see, and certainly for those living in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cates. That was very enlightening. Uh, our last, uh, paper presenter, but certainly not least, is Dr. Chris uh, Beyer. Uh, Dr. Beyer is the Desmond Tutu Professor of Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins Blumberg School of Public Health. He is also a professor of epidemiology, international health, health behavior and society and nursing. He serves as the director of the Johns Hopkins Training Program in HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Science, and is the founding director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights and he is going to really summarize uh, with a call to action. Dr. Beyer. Well, thank you so much, Sally, and uh, wonderful to be with everybody. And, uh, and once again, to hear uh, the presentations on these really, um, really terrific series of papers. Uh, what we uh, have done with these Lancet series, and this is the, the attempt anyway to pull it all together is to uh, take all the science that everybody has uh, generated, analyzed, put together that you've just heard uh, and say, okay, what do we need to do uh, going forward to try and do better? And this is really motivated powerfully by, uh, of course, the, the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative and its very ambitious targets. Uh, of achieving a 75% a reduction uh, in HIV incidence over the, the following five years. This was from about two years ago, and uh, then a 90% reduction by 10 years. And the most recent CDC estimates are that the US epidemic has been declining at about 2% a year. So that is nowhere near enough to achieve the goal. So we really asked ourselves the big question, given what we've learned, given what we see in these papers, what will it take for the EHE uh, initiative really to succeed? That, that is the driver behind this paper. Um, we also, of course, uh, widened uh, from the series uh, co-editors, that was myself, Ada Adamora, uh, Ken Mayer, and Patrick Sullivan, including all the first authors for the papers, and then a number of our community uh, partners and leaders, Ernest Hopkins from uh, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Greg Millett from AMFAR, um, Rochelle Walensky at the time at Mass General, now, <laughs> of course, at the head of the CDC, Mitch Warren from ABAC, Bruce Richmond, who's been such a leader in you know, the U equals U movement, and Rania Copeland, who's the executive director of the Black AIDS Institute. Uh, so this is very much uh, a, a broader stakeholder kind of analysis about, about where we are and what, what it will take to really get control of this epidemic. So just the next slide, please. So uh, I wanna just talk about, if you can hit the animation, this will start to come up. Um, yeah. Um, so what are, what are we thinking really is going to need to change? Well, uh, as you heard, and, and I think Jen's paper really summarizes this, 
The EHE initiative does promise new resources and focus and political will. We hope that it's going to be continued by the Biden administration and that it will be vigorously uh, funded and supported. But its biggest challenge is uneven treatment and prevention coverage and this heterogeneous uh, mix of uninsured and underinsured Americans. That, that is really the, one of the fundamental challenges. The epidemiology uh, that you heard from Patrick uh, is not just about the epidemiology of infections, but it's also about the epi of access. Uh, and both of those uh, really need to drive and focus EHE. And as many of you will know, there were uh, a number of jurisdictions, about 48, that were identified as having uh, very high burdens. They are the EHE primary targets, but that included seven rural states, uh, all but one in the South, that had this pattern that Patrick pointed out to you of much higher burdens in rural areas. And that, of course, again, is very much the map uh, of underinsurance. So that's most severe in the South, uh, more than a third of new infections, um, uh, sorry, more than half of new infections, but only 37% of the population. Uh, and that does appear to be, if anything, concentrating. Uh, and so uh, you've heard about multiple drivers of transmission. That means we're going to need multifaceted approaches for prevention and engagement and care. Uh, but most fundamentally, uh, EHE is not going to succeed if we can't do better with expanding the healthcare franchise. I think that is just fundamental. It's just a reality. And it's one of the reasons why uh, of the top 10 most affected countries worldwide, there's only one. Uh, industrialized developed country uh, on that list, and that is the United States. 1.2 million people, we estimate, living with HIV out of the 38 million worldwide. Uh, and of course, uh, our sort of sister and brother countries, our peer countries, as Jen referred to them, uh, virtually all having a uh, much broader uh, and expansive health franchise than we do. Next, please. So there is a great deal of urgency required uh, if we're really going to do this and, and get on a trajectory of declining infections and speed uh, both new infections uh, and AIDS mortality declines uh, to get to these ambitious goals. Um, and there are some structural realities and barriers we're going to have to deal with. Um, PrEP uptake and use remains much too low and particularly in the populations who need it most particularly, as Ken pointed out, young MSM of color, uh, but also, of course, uh, heterosexual women, particularly black women, the rates remain very low. And there are significant uh, cost barriers. Uh, we are really calling for a much lower cost uh, for PrEP uh, and particularly no cost for people uh, most in need who, who have financial barriers to it. We really need to start thinking about PrEP as a public health intervention, not a kind of uh, option for people with good insurance who might want to reduce their risk. We also need more and better tools. We're expectant and hopeful that uh, long-acting injectables, both for prevention and treatment, are going to come online. Uh, uh, long-acting injectable cabotegravir perhaps this year. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, these are um, tools that will be of interest to, to some and we hope are going to make a difference. But we really need some more of the mo more fundamental tools. And as we have all lived through uh, the incredible impact of the COVID-19 EUA vaccines uh, on that epidemic, we still need an HIV vaccine. We need to continue that work. We also have an enormous number of people, as I said, 1.2 million uh, living with this virus who really are hoping uh, for sustained remission or a cure. And I have to say that as somebody running an HIV training program, uh, that the energy and the enthusiasm of the next generation of HIV researchers is really in this cure arena. It's extraordinary how much effort is underway, how much enthusiasm there is, and that is critically important. We are deeply grateful to the Office of AIDS Research uh, and the NIH for the sustained investment in the HIV research portfolio. Uh, but it's too soon to declare victory. The tools we have uh, still require, uh, certainly with treatment, um, daily oral therapy for life, 
that is a serious burden for people uh, and, uh, and sustained remission. Uh, and some of what we've learned from the new science uh, uh, that has emerged around the COVID vaccines and the possibility of broadly neutralizing antibodies playing a role in sustained remission, all of this is a really exciting research agenda that has to be continued. Um, we are in this for the long haul. Uh, the life expectancy now of somebody living with HIV is in the 70s. Uh, and uh, of course, we have a, a high burden, uh, a complex epidemic, as you've heard, that's going to require sustained uh, investments also in the next generation of researchers right, and clinicians and providers. Um, so uh, we, we think there is a great deal of work to be done. Um, we, of course, are not on a trajectory to uh, achieve the EHE goals at this point. We all agree that it would be wonderful if we were, uh, and that is going to take a, a multifaceted effort and sustained investment in research uh, and in the next generation of researchers. Um, many of us have been at this all of our careers, and. Uh, and uh, we're, we're thrilled about uh, the fact that there are young investigators who really want to take this on. So I'm going to close there and uh, greatly looking forward to the response of our panelists. Uh, thank again, uh, the NIH, NIDA, Office of AIDS Research, uh, and National Institute of General Medical Sciences, and Lancet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beyer, for that uh, sobering uh, call to action. Uh, we now have three respondents that come from very diverse perspectives. The first is Dr. Leandro Mena. Uh, he is a clinician, researcher, and public health advocate with expertise in the prevention and clinical management of sexually transmitted infections and HIV. Uh, he's really uh, just quite remarkable. He's the founding chair of the Department of Population Health Science at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, John Bower School of Population Health, and professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. And he directs the Center for HIV AIDS Research, Education and Policy at the Murley Evers Williams Institute for Elimination of Health Disparities, and serves as the STD Medical Director for the state of Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Mena, as, as this shows, is, is just remarkable. He is a key investigator in the University of Mississippi Center for Translational Research there. And uh, we're looking forward to his comments and his take on these papers. Dr. Mena? Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Dr. Holler, for the invitation to be here. It's really a, quite an honor to be uh, among so many you know, illustrious colleagues. Uh, you know, the presentations today uh, of the last series on HIV in America, with a focus on HIV in rural, uh, rural America, really, you know, uh, are an important recognition and of the unique challenges that we will have to address in our country to end the HIV uh, epidemic for all Americans. Um, it was mentioned earlier by Dr. Sullivan, you know, the HIV disparities are not only the differences in health outcomes for a particular population in our country, but they really reflect, you know, this proportional difference, you know, attributable, attributable you know, to individual provider, you know, health system, social, um, environmental, economic, and structural factors. And these differences, you know, are often exacerbated in rural areas. Um, it's important to recognize, you know, that rural areas, you know, comprise, you know, only five to 8% of the US HIV cases. You know, in some parts, you know, it's very similar to the urban or non-rural, you know, HIV epidemic in the sense that about 50% of rural cases are African-American, 75% happen in men, 60% uh, among men with men. But the cases as mentioned by Dr. Feinberg, you know, in rural areas are actually higher in rural areas than they are, you know, in urban settings. Um, the South uh, is disproportionately affected by HIV. Uh, also has the highest proportion of individuals living in rural areas with a diagnosis of HIV, um, but not totally unexpected. You know, 68% of AIDS cases among rural populations are in the South. So in states like Alabama and Mississippi, over 50% of their population living with HIV diagnosis live in rural areas. You know, and data from HRSA basically says that rural visits, you know, to rural providers tend to be by individuals who are older, uh, live or are below the federal poverty level and uninsured. You know, we saw in Dr. May's presentation um, important differences, right? The rural white people, you know, who may be at risk of HIV, gender sexual minorities, you know, live in rural communities. But we also saw, you know, um, some of the factors, you know, that really can have an in, in 
important impact you know, on the HIV epidemic. And many of them are particularly you know, relevant to the Southern region. You know, I would like to highlight you know, some of them. You know, first is the fact that it has been mentioned by many here, the fact that only nine out of the 14 states, uh, that nine out of the 14 states that have not expanded Medicaid are in the Southern, you know, in the South. So think about how Southern rural communities have, why they have a higher proportion of uninsured residents. Second, you know, along with this, there's a higher unemployment rate you know, and con consistent with this, you know, there is uh, more poverty in rural communities with the understanding that poverty in black communities differs from poverty in white communities and how the legacy of uh, racism has left black Americans more vulnerable to health disparities, including HIV. Then, you know, finally, I think, you know, there's limited a health system capacity, infrastructure and investment. And this is particularly true for rural areas where HIV stigma, homophobia, transphobia, um, prejudice, and fear of discrimination really further limits access to any available services. Addressing the needs of people with HIV in rural communities means developing you know, innovative approaches, as it was mentioned, to ultimately you know, provide culturally competent quality HIV prevention and care services that support pre-exposure prophylaxis access and persistence you know, for those with indications, rapid access you know, to HIV treatment, you know, and, uh, and, and, and systems you know, that support individuals' you know, engagement in care as well as viral suppression. Um, as it was mentioned with Dr. Feinberg, by Dr. Feinberg, you know, access to quality cultural competence for harm reduction uh, strategies for individuals who are at risk or use you know, substance, substances. In, in addition to that, there's some key structural things. I mean, I totally agree, you know, I mentioned with uh, a, a medical expansion, you know, but transportation is important to, uh, to really, you know, facilitate access to care. We have to think about alternative medical visits, you know, like telehealth, you know, COVID has really given us important lessons that we can apply to support end the HIV epidemic efforts in rural communities. You know, at UMC, you know, at University of Mississippi Medical Center, we have a HRSA funded Center for Excellence in Telehealth to address health things, particularly in rural community. And, and we saw that in the pre-COVID, you know, year, right? We have about 12,000 telehealth visits. You know, this last year during COVID, we had over 131,000 telehealth visits. So I think it's important to think about how we can really leverage, you know, telehealth and, and make sure that we set the basis, you know, the financial basis to make it sustainable, you know, so we can support individuals who are living with HIV or need access to HIV and prevention services who are living in rural areas. We have to think about alternate, alternative case management models. And really don't forget about the need to make sure that individuals in rural areas have access to HIV education and awareness, perhaps you know, leveraging you know, the workforce available out there you know, through community health workers that may help you know, to educate people who live in rural areas and uh, try to bridge some of the isolation that many people who live in these communities have experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mena. Uh, our next respondent is Dr. Gary Stein, who's director of the University of Vermont Cancer Center, professor and chairperson of the Department of Biochemistry and a professor of surgery. Um, trained in biology and pathology as a longstanding dedication to translating mechanistic understanding of cancer biology into clinically relevant investigation. So you might ask, why do we have a cancer guy here today? Well, he's the principal investigator of the uh, Northern New England Clinical and Translational Research Center. Uh, and he has been very focused on rural health. Uh, they have a practice-based research network that is really focusing on addiction and treatment of addiction and substance use. And so Dr. Stein, uh, you're, th we're not cancer guys here. I know you're out of your element, but, but we wanna hear what you have to say. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, that's basically Sally based on my upbringing. My mom always told me I should be seen but not heard. So I'm just have to get accustomed to unmuting myself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, first of all, it re I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to attend and participate in this session. That statement is not a formality. It's really been a learning experience for me. And I actually see a number of similarities with respect to how to address the HIV crisis, uh, very similar to how we really need to uh, look to optimize how we address you know, cancer. With cancer, what we think about is education. We think about prevention. 
we certainly are going to try to optimize treatment, but for survivorship is really the key uh, objective. And what we are trying to do is to take cancer and make it from a life-threatening acute illness to really a chronic disease that could be treated the same way as diagnosis. So what are the analogies with respect to, uh, to HIV? We've heard a lot, we've heard this from all of the speakers that prevention is key. Uh, it's you, if you could avoid the problem, then you don't have to worry about how to go ahead and to um, treat uh, the problem. So that becomes very key. And secondly, um, clearly we need it. We need a vaccine that is going to go ahead and result in a permanent um, solution but we also are going to be looking at how you sustain people who encounter HIV so that they're going to have maximum quality of life and also to be able to keep healthcare costs um, you know, in a, you know, to, you know, to a reasonable level. Education is key. Um, and education is probably one of the most difficult challenges that we face. How do you persuade people to think and act differently. And we can look at urban versus rural, and we could talk about the lessons learned from urban and uh, rural. We can talk about the particular subgroups that exist in different parts of the country. But what may be very important is to try to start off with increased understanding of what type of messaging are each of the groups, each of the communities going to be receptive to. And that can make a significant difference because it's not one approach fits all. And what we are beginning to learn that it is not just regional, it is not just racial or ethnic, it's not just a question of access to healthcare, what are folks going to be uh, receptive to? And I could tell you from our experience, we are trying to address this with HPV vaccination. So that's something that um, really relates to all of the challenges that were pointed out by all of the speakers. And in terms of all of the calls to action, they really have to be uh, addressed within a context of what are the folks going to be receptive to. When we talk about rurality, there isn't a single def that definition of rurality. Uh, there are shared and there are certain unique characteristics. And again, I think messaging becomes uh, extremely important. Then we are dealing with the current uh, challenges of uh, COVID. That to me has really changed the entire uh, landscape because a lot of the progress that has been made, we're going to have catch up afterwards access to healthcare or people's receptiveness to healthcare has gone ahead and changed. People rationalize right now, not seeking treatment because they are concerned about uh, contact. Um, they are concerned about health risks. So again, we may have to rethink a lot of the strategies and on an interim basis, that's going to be extremely important, but we need to think post COVID and there's going to be a lot of catching up to do. So we're going to have to address the particular um, roadmaps that we have put into place for addressing HPV. And we need to be able to work with that within the context of the current challenges that we're facing in terms of healthcare, access to healthcare and um, receptiveness um, you know, to, uh, to healthcare. Those to me are real concerns that uh, are important. And lastly, the other thing I was going to mention was that and it's been said already by two speakers that one of the most difficult challenges that we've had in terms of developing therapeutics has been vaccine um, uh, development. And there are clearly some important lessons that have been learned from developing the, um, the COVID uh, vaccine and it really falls into two different categories. One is lessons learned in terms of enhanced capabilities with technologies, but also we learned a lot in terms of working relationships that previously did not exist between pharma, academia, and uh, the NIH. And if we could draw on some of those, I think that is going to be incredibly important.
last thing that we have been trying to grapple with with respect to uh, COVID is what really falls again, there are two dimensions to it. How do we deal with the current challenges of COVID and how do we deal with the infection and treatment related consequences that we're going to be encountering on a long-term basis? And there again, I think there are some very significant lessons that can be learned with respect to uh, HIV. So I think that what we need to uh, address is the challenges that we uh, currently have with HIV, some of the current pandemic related consequences that we're going to have to deal with on a long-term basis and drawing on some fantastic relationships that have been built and try to leverage some of those into making process of progress and accelerating progress. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. I have certainly learned a heck of a lot more than what I've been able to contribute to it. Thank you very, very much for your comments. Our last respondent uh, uh, brings a community perspective. Dr. Lou Artenzio is a retired family physician uh, and he's a, a resident of Bridgeport, uh, West Virginia, the executive director of the Clarksburg Mission, a homeless shelter and recovery center and Christian community. And he's the ministry leader of Celebrate Recovery at Clarksburg Baptist Church and he's state representative. Um, he is a recovery coach and a member of the Harrison County Recovery Coach uh, Association. And he celebrates uh, recovery from opioid addiction uh, with over 17 years of sobriety. Um, he is a superb community advocate who has been there and, and really understands, I think in a way that, that many of us cannot. And he provided the community uh, perspective for the Lancet paper in the series on opioids and HIV that Dr. Feinberg addressed, and it is quite insightful. Dr. Artenzio? Gosh, Sally, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating in this. Uh, I was an early casualty of the, the uh, opioid epidemic. As a family physician for about 28 years, I developed opioid use disorder. By the grace of God, it was not uh, injection drug use. Um, but it did cost me my medical license in the course of everything, but that's okay because it really raised me up to do work that I think now is much more important than anything I ever did as a family physician, working in our homeless shelter here in Clarksburg, serving in recovery ministry, running a recovery center, and trying to offer hope to folks because if, if Lou can make it, maybe I can make it is kind of the message there. Um, gosh, Dr. Mayer talked about the wonderful attributes of rural life, and there's no doubt that uh, living in small town America in rural West Virginia is wonderful, but sometimes I see, sadly, the backside of all that stuff because we have a terrible lack of education on public health matters. Uh, we have maybe a little better misunderstanding, but it progresses along to stigma to prejudice and sadly to sometimes frank hatred against vulnerable groups who deal with substance use disorder, mental health issues, um, and, and um, prejudice against evidence-based medicine, Medicaid assisted treatment, and terrible misunderstanding of what harm reduction and syringe exchange is all about. I've seen, uh, I, I continually deal with the city in trying to come against us as a homeless shelter offering hope to folks. But more importantly, I guess, relative to this discussion, I've seen political campaigns in our state, political campaigns in our city against harm reduction, against syringe exchange, and in other cities in West Virginia police chiefs running for office, running for position based on coming against harm reduction because they don't understand it and they can't, they, they won't look at the evidence of it. So we had a robust syringe exchange program at our health department in downtown Clarksburg, which was very effective in making a big difference, but the municipality, the city shut it down with an ordinance. And we're not the only city in West Virginia that, that has occurred. That's happened in our state capital. And in Charleston, there's been an HIV outbreak. I mean, I, 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 it's, we've got an awful lot of work to do in rural West Virginia to help people understand um, the stigma comes against um, all kinds of vulnerable people. And I deal with that every day. The majority of the folks that we serve at our homeless shelter, 90% have substance use disorder. Some have a mental health issue underlying it. 
but substance use disorder has just taken over small town America as, as our towns have been decimated. Um, poverty pockets in West Virginia exist and in that, those poverty pockets, previously prosperous areas are suffering dramatically with, with poverty, with lack of uh, education, with lack of jobs, and then with substance use disorder that seems to take over. And it's really hard. I understand the problems that our municipalities have because they want to redevelop, revitalize our towns, but everyone downtown is poor and suffering with substance use disorder anymore. And it's really hard to revive a town with that going on. I don't want to be so negative on one hand because I have seen things improve dramatically. The Affordable Care Act was a sea change for the folks that I get to serve. Uh, folks have Medicaid now where they didn't have Medicaid before and because they have Medicaid, they can get care that they never got before. The treatment options, both in terms of some Medicaid and assisted treatment, but certainly in terms of uh, detox and, and residential treatment has skyrocketed. So I see a great deal of hope and, and I see a lot of success stories every day of folks who turn their lives around uh, given an opportunity. I, I also have seen the drug war come against folks and, and cause our prison rate, uh, incarceration rate to, to go up. But I've seen the good side of that uh, uh, turning around in drug court. Uh, I see folks who offered treatment in the criminal justice system become stellar recovery community members. Uh, so, and, and a lot of the number of the people that I employ get to employ here at the mission and our homeless shelter are drug court graduates and they've learned the tricks. They have the street cred uh, that, that really helps folks see a chance to turn their life around, to see love and hope. Um, so we've got terrible issues, but we've got some successes too. Uh, we've got a lot of education and, and stigma reversal to accomplish. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Lou. That was, that was greatly appreciated. We'll turn now to our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, the first uh, panelist is uh, our cabinet secretary, uh, Bill Crouch. Uh, he was appointed by Governor Justice in 2017. He had previously worked in acute care hospitals, uh, but his public health care knowledge he put to use at the West Virginia State Health Department uh, Office of Community and Health Services, and later as the first uh, executive director of what is now the West Virginia Healthcare Authority. Uh, you know, um, Secretary Crouch has really played a pivotal role in I think much of the success that we have had with COVID. And, you know, I think that, that uh, Dr. Atenzio pointed out some of the needs we have, but also some of the successes that West Virginia has really been able to, to implement that uh, touch on HIV. And I, I wonder, Secretary Crouch, if you would like to make some comments and, and particularly, you know, I think all solutions are local, uh, you know, talk a bit about some of the integration uh, that DHHR has, has facilitated for treatment in rural clinics. Secretary Crouch? Oh, thank you, Sally. Uh, gosh, what an esteemed group. I, um, I, I've learned a lot uh, uh, listening to you. I, I thank you all. In many ways, uh, a, a lot of what you talked about sounds like West Virginia. Uh, we, we are rural. We have some, uh, some, some real issues out there to tackle. Um, I, I certainly don't take any credit credit for our success uh, with the uh, with the immunization program and our our battle with uh, COVID. Uh, Dr. Marsh has been uh, absolutely terrific, uh, being our science leader. And uh, I tell everyone he, he starts pushing uh, articles to me about six thirty in the morning, and a whole group of people. And uh, so, so that's how my day starts. And most of the time, that's how my day ends with other articles being pushed to me from Clay. So uh, that and the governor's leadership in terms of this, he really does have his pulse on this uh, on this uh, virus. And 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 we're we're doing a good job. But it's it's the relationships we have with with WVU and 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 our local health departments and our hospitals and our, our, our clinics throughout the state. We stay in constant contact with them. So it, it's really a joint effort. Uh, so, uh, so but thank you for those kind words, uh, Sally. Uh, I, you know, I heard uh, Dr. Baer talk about education and, uh, and stigma. And, 
and prevention access. And, and that really is, th those are the key issues that we need to discuss with regard to HIV. And then Dr. Stein talking about uh, education is key and, and access to care. I mean, that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to focus on. Our local providers out there, uh, Dr. Kil Kilkenny in, uh, in Cabell County and, and Dr. Young here in, in Kanawha County have just done a tremendous job trying to uh, track uh, cases, looking hard at, at what can be done and trying to build that safety net even, uh, even stronger. That's what we have to do. We have folks that fall through the cracks everywhere. I mean, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, COVID, uh, trying to get them immunized or, or whether it's HIV and trying to get folks care. Um, it's, it's that education and, and, and again, the stigma that we have that we really have to overcome. So uh, we're working on that to, through those partnerships uh, with, with our local folks. We support them. We're in constant contact with them. I can't say enough about uh, how, how good of a job they, they do in West Virginia. I've told a couple of them if I could just clone them uh, and, and spread them out throughout the state a little bit more, I think we'd, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd get where we want to be a little faster. So, uh, but thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be a part of this group. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Crouch. I think now uh, we'll get back to the COVID czar, uh, Dr. Marsh, in just a minute, but I wanted to turn back to our NIH partners. Uh, you know, Dr. Goodnow, who I previously introduced, you know, we've had a lot of, of information and ideas. What does OAR need to do? What is OAR's role in, uh, you know, ending the HIV epidemic in rural America? Thanks, Sally. Yes. Um... You know, the OAR just very briefly was established actually in 1988 by Congress, and it was authorized to develop the HIV strategic plan for NIH. And over the um, past 40 years, the cumulative investment has really produced groundbreaking discoveries and innovations for HIV research that continue to have even broader applications, particularly for the COVID-19 pandemic and for ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. When we were here um, uh, virtually in the fall and met with uh, the stakeholders in West Virginia, some of the messages we heard were needs to integra integrate care, the need to integrate funding for research so that different health issues um, could be studied more comprehensively. Um, we heard that West Virginia is a unique setting um, and we also heard that the NIH should include poverty in NIH disparities, models, and funding. NIH supports research that um, should be looking at ways to address stigma around substance use and epidemics. And people-centered approaches are needed in the research agenda so that delivering care and um, publishing epidemiology data can become the new norms and there can be a rapid exchange of data into policy and practice. What strikes me is that so many of those um, remarks and comments really uh, resonate with the articles that we heard discussed today. Um, the current environment is producing uh, or providing basically challenges and opportunities that we didn't anticipate. Um, but for the research enterprise, um, the ending the HIV epidemic and the role of the NIH in this is really to drive the new discoveries that can be applied in the communities. And part of this um, focus of the NIH is to extend the research platform and the research uh, footprint from the 57 original jurisdictions where 50% of the new HIV incidents or diagnoses are occurring to really expand that to be able to reach the goals of a 90% reduction in new infections by 2030. We can't reach 90% if we're only looking at 50% of the area. So I think that's a very key um, way and a, and a key objective of the NIH. I think the other really important part is that um, We've really enhanced our commitment to nurturing and advancing research careers of a diverse pool of investigators, 
including early stage investigators and particularly those from underrepresented groups and to partnering with historically under-resourced institutions and organizations to ensure the flow of new ideas reflective of all, committee, uh, all communities that are affected by HIV and related conditions. And I think partnering with um, uh, programs such as the ones that you have in West Virginia, but under the IDEA state with NIGMS is one example um, of these opportunities for expanding research. Thank you, Dr. Goodenow. And that is actually a natural segue to uh, Dr. Michelle McGurl, who is representing uh, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. McGurl is the chief of the Research Advancement Programs Branch in the Division of Research Capacity Building at uh, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Uh, and she's also our project scientist for the Centers for Clinical and Translational Research. Prior to coming to NIH, she had a distinguished uh, career uh, in uh, studying structural uh, protein structure and function uh, in Montana. Um, and uh, Dr. McGraw, I'd like you to, to really sort of just follow on what uh, Dr. Goodnow said about training, um, you know, opportunities for early stage investigators, uh, and how that works with the Centers for Translational Research, particularly with the focus of those to really reach out. You've required now all the CTRs to have practice-based research networks out in, in areas. You know, how do you see this fitting into the end the epidemic for HIV agenda? Sally, um, so the, the IDEA State program is really meant to focus on rural health, right? And all the issues that are faced um, by idea states, which are largely rural. So uh, there's a lot of lack of access to healthcare and to clinical research. And so the idea state is a congressionally mandated program designed specifically to get at that. And part of that is to grow the research infrastructure and support research being done by those who are interested in HIV and um, opioid research and all the intersections. And that includes the typical lab bench research and physician scientist work. There's lots of funding in those um, in all of the IDEA programs to support pilot projects and to recruit early stage investigators to come in and start the research. But beyond bench science, um, it includes social and behavioral and implementation research. Uh, these are just so critical. And we expect to see uh, highly customized regional approaches to getting out to reach the rural and remote uh, areas in the, in the idea states. And I say remote because, you know, I lived on a nice farm in Massachusetts for a while, right? I, it was rural, but it wasn't remote. I could drive not too far and get access to great healthcare. That wasn't the case in Montana. And it's certainly not the case for uh, the majority of the states that we talked about. And I want to know, I, I looked at that swath of HIV uh, epidemic states in the South, and I know the majority of them are idea states. Um, you know, we, we support thematic centers through the COBRE program, um, and that it really builds the uh, capacity in terms of faculty who are doing research. Mm -hmm. And there's just lots of opportunities. Those of you who have like R01s and R15s that just missed the pay line, um, talk to me about IDEA co-funding because we can help any, I, any NIH institute reach you if you just miss their pay lines and get the funding by providing some incentives for that. So we have a broad program uh, and HIV research is included in that umbrella of funding. And if it's a problem in your region and you're in an IDEA state, we wanna help you address it. Great, thank you. And last but not least is my favorite boss ever, Dr. Clay Marsh, who is the Executive Dean of the West Virginia University School of Medicine and Vice President for Health Sciences, where he oversees uh, five health science schools and in three campuses. Uh, he has been the COVID czar, uh, Secretary Crouch referred to him. Uh, you know, we're sort of running up against the last couple of minutes. So Clay, you're great at summarizing I don't think we're going to have a lot of time for discussion. Uh, you know, so what's your take? What do we need to do from all of these great ideas? 
Well, thank you, Sally, and, and thank each of you for what you do to help so many people. You know, it seems like that there's a, a few issues, but let me just talk briefly about what we've learned working together with COVID-19 and how I see these parallels. You know, West Virginia is a rural state and not unlike many other states with many, many problems, internal and external, but we've come together and answered a higher calling to help people. And that's become a very personal issue with many of us, but we've seen people come together. And I think that there are certainly systemic issues that need to be addressed. Access to healthcare, certainly, insurance, fair play, um, stigma. We know that, you know that there's many problems with feeling socially isolated and losing your social capital. You know, I know Sally knows very well, uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton. And, and I think that there's many parallels between what we see from, from people who suffer from chronic disease, because having a chronic disease and suffering from a chronic disease are not the same thing. But I think that most importantly, to me, power today is not in position or resources only. It's really in connection with networks of influence and being fewer degrees of separation away from that. And ultimately the way forward is not gonna be only through a policy solution or through only an educational program. It's really gonna be from all of us coming together and using the personal commitments we have to help others to link arm in arm and start looking not at each other as competitors, but as compatriots, um, answering a higher calling. The root word of health is hail, H-A-L-E, which is also the root word of heal, of holy, and of holistic, and it means whole. It means unity, together, as one. And I think that what we see today is a great hope in a disease that when I was training killed the person that it infected to today being a chronic disease to tomorrow perhaps being not a disease at all. But I would say for each one of you, you've made extraordinary progress in what was a killer not very long ago. And you should be very proud of that. And our work is not done, but maybe our work is never done. So thank you, Sally, for having this. Judith, thank you for what you're doing for the university. Bill, thank you for what you're doing for the state. And Lou, you're an inspiration to me and perhaps the single most powerful experience I've had since I've returned home to do this job was attended an, a, 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 a Celebrate Recovery um, experience with Lou about people that have been addicted in, in the recovery journey. Unbelievable. So thank you all. I want to thank all of our panelists, presenters, experts. I had hoped we would have a conversation, but I, I think the comments were so rich and we have a hard stop at one o'clock. In closing, I would also like to thank our CTSI staff, Stephanie Ballard Conrad, Dahlia El Saeed, and uh, Mitra Matashman who have, you know, we couldn't have done it without them. So thank you all. I think there's much work to do and there's more conversation needed. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Everybody take care.